Okay, let's go in. Week two, Lord, teach us to pray. Um, if you have your Bibles, you can get those out if you want to. If you're not, that's okay. You can follow along. I'm going to go to Luke chapter 11, and then I'm going to go to Psalm 62. So I've got two verses that I want to frame our conversation with. And uh, the first one is Luke 11, verses 1 through 2. This is the Lord's Prayer. Um, actually, it's really not. It's more the disciples' prayer. The Lord's Prayer is found in John. But this is him teaching. It's been labeled the Lord's Prayer. And I doubt I'm going to change your understanding of that. Luke chapter 11, verses 1 through 2, it says this. Now, Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And now Jesus says, and when he said to them, when you pray, say, Father. We're going to stop right there. Father. Now, I want you to go to Psalm 62. And it says here, verses 5 through 8, for God alone Oh, my soul, wait in silence, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my fortress. I shall not be shaken. On God rests my salvation and my glory. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge to us. Before I pray, I'd love to title this message, Getting to Know You. Getting to Know You. Let's pray. God, I pray over the next few moments. The Lord, you would speak to us, you would teach us, you would encourage us, you would challenge us. God, you would reveal a deeper truth to us than maybe we grasp or understand this morning. God, I pray over every person, God, whether they're just trying to figure you out, or God, whether they're doing their best to follow you, God, you would just show us, God, the next step you have, God, for us just to take as we get closer and closer to you. Because God, we know this, the closer we get to you, the more we look like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Come on, church. Everybody said amen. amen. You guys can grab your seats, pull your participation guides out. There's going to be some great content here for you to apply during your week as we look at prayer. Um, one other quick just announcement. Next week is going to be Baptism Sunday. And this is a big Sunday for us. Yeah, and so if you want to be baptized, then uh, you can sign up on your participation guide and go to the next step, steps table. Uh, but more importantly, this is as a church where we get to celebrate victory. It's because when people make their public confession of faith, that's when the church rejoices. Amen. Because that's when brothers and sisters go public in their faith. So make sure you're here for that. And if you have an empty seat next to you, invite somebody with you. I know it'll be good. You know, the funny thing, uh, I don't know if you had a nickname growing up. Did anybody have a nickname with your friends growing up or in your family? Nicknames are kind of a funny thing, like how quickly they are developed on really uh, the lack of information about who you are as a person. You ever notice that? Like nicknames can be developed rather quickly and they stick for a long time. And sometimes they're not friendly. And sometimes they're not kind. Like maybe you grew up and you had a runny nose one day at school and everybody just decided to call you snot. And you're like, why you got, like, I'm actually, I have a master's degree now. Why are you still calling me snot? Because of one day in your life, right, you know, maybe one, uh, you know, well, I won't go there. But, you know, the funny thing is about nicknames is you can develop them really quickly and then they stick forever. Like some people have had nicknames for thousands or for hundreds of years. In fact, there's old medieval kings that used to have certain nicknames about their rule, but there's a few that are not very flattering. In fact, there was a king of uh, France, his name was Charles, and they named him him Charles the Silly. How many of you guys would love to be remembered in history books as Eric the Silly? Another one, Louis V, was known as Louis the Lazy, right? Like nicknames are kind of one of these things where it's like, you don't really know me, you've just assigned an identity to me that doesn't encapsulate all of the, the personhood in which I am. It's kind of funny, especially in like social media days, you can, you try to describe yourself in a bio and you're like, I don't know how to, how to really capture all of who I am in just a few words. So you do your best, maybe on a resume or an Indeed profile, you're trying to just capture a little bit of who you are. It's funny because as a society, oftentimes, unintentionally, we boil or dilute people down to just a few things about them and then we come to know them as that thing. Even though there's more depth to a person, we end up being to identify them as this particular one-dimensional thing because it's just easier for us to remember, or maybe it's just that's how we know them. And to truly understand somebody and to know them, I must know them in their complexity, right? Like you guys are complex people. You're not one-dimensional. I'm a complex person. I'm a pastor, but I'm also a husband. 
I'm also a father. I'm also a Texan. Yeah, thank you. I was trying to set some easy amens for y'all, right? Like, I'm a foodie. Uh, I, I'm a history buff, right? I like fitness and foodie. Sometimes that doesn't go together, but you know, I make it work in the tension of complexity. Like, I'm the type of person, I really like Lord of the Rings. I like, a, I like Lord of the Rings, but I really also like bad boys with Will Smith and Martin. You see how I'm, I'm, I'm a complex individual. And, and when you get to know me, you can know me as pastor, but you must understand that there's deeper complexity than just me as pastor or as me as husband. There's me as father. There's me as sports fan. There's me as all these other things. And when you begin to know the complexity of who I am, your depth of knowledge of who I am grows. And I think a lot of us, our relationship with God can oftentimes become the same way. We develop very one-dimensional uh, uh, ideas of who God is based on certain things. So I'd like to make the understatement of the year really quick. The God of the Bible is extremely complex. Duh. I get that, right? You see, I will never know God completely, but I can know God clearly. Meaning this, I am a limited being trying to understand completely an unlimited being. I'm not going to be able to. I don't have the mental faculties to be able to understand God completely, but I can know him clearly. You see, I can know him clearly because God has chosen to reveal himself through scripture and I can know the God of the Bible clearly. Now, I know that there's deeper things to God, even beyond Scripture, so I can't know Him completely, like I can't know everything about God, but what God has told me about Himself, I can know clearly, amen? And so there's, there's, there's parts of us, and there's people, and we all do this, it's natural, sometimes it's intentional, sometimes it's ignorance, sometimes it's poor teaching, sometimes it's just a situation we find ourselves where we have simplified God down to this little thing that we know him as, and that affects our ability to connect with him in conversation. You see, last week we looked at how powerful prayer can be, and the disciples who had a close-up first-person view of Jesus, spent three years with him, watched Jesus do all these incredible things, watched him heal, watched him walk on water, watched him preach, watched him teach, watched him go to the cross, watched him come back on the third day, watched Jesus do all these incredible things, but yet the disciples wanted Jesus to teach them how to pray. So prayer is this powerful thing that for many of us, let's be honest, many of us is often a weak point in our relationship with God. Come on, are you like me? The, the biggest thing I ask God for in my life is, God, I just want to pray more. But how many of you guys know life gets busy? I get distracted. Sometimes I'm weak in my flesh. And like every year there's that season where like, God, I'm going to pray more. I'm going to spend more time with you. And it lasts about five days. Anybody else like that? Come on, like am I the only one being honest? Or are y'all just being like, five days, this is five minutes for me, right? Like, but it's limited. And isn't it funny how the enemy works? Like, like if you don't pray for an extended period of time, then the enemy starts condemning you and going like, you really don't love Jesus. You're really not that good of a Christian. You don't pray. And then you feel guilty because you're going, well, God, I'm a bad person, right? And, and okay, maybe I can't pray to you. Isn't it funny, though? Like, like, like after, you, after, after you haven't talked to God in a long time and then you hit an emergency in your life, and you're like, I know I need to go to God, but like, I haven't talked to him in a while. So like, hey, God, I need to ask you for some things. But you don't ask right away. You come in and be like, so God, what you, what you been up to lately? And you try to like kind of softball it. You're like, I can't ask right away. I haven't prayed in like six months. So let me say all the prayer language I know. And then 90 seconds, all right, God, here's actually what I really need. Like, can you come through for me? Like, I need some help in this situation. Come on. Does anybody else do that like me sometimes? You see, prayer is so important. And oftentimes our perception of how we view God affects how we pray to God. So a lot of us, we have a one-dimensional view, and we only know God as judge. Maybe you grew up in a church that was all hellfire and brimstone and sin, sin, sin. You're going to die and burn go to hell. And so therefore, your framework of God is that he is a judge. 
Now, yes, God is a judge, but he is more than just a judge. But when we only have an idea of God as a judge, we spend all our time repenting to God. Come on, I grew up in the church, so I gave my heart to Jesus like 132 times. Like every night before I go to, went to bed, there was a season in my life where I was like, I know I sinned some today, so if I don't ask Jesus into my heart again, I'm going to go to hell, right? So I would go to bed, I'd pray, Jesus, forgive me of all the sins I did, come into my heart, I just want to go to heaven in Jesus' name. Because I had a framework, a perception that God was a judge. Some of us have a, a perception that God is a creator, and, and that's kind of the only perception we have. And so, so it's wonder and it's majesty and it's awe and it's praise and it's good. But, but how can I have a personal relationship with this really mighty creator? So, so my, 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 my prayer life kind of feels limited because all I understand him is as a creator. You see, we begin to develop perceptions based around the narratives that we feel comfortable with. So some of us, especially in today's age, we view God as a friend, which he is. But we only view him as a friend. He's our cosmic buddy, meaning that there's moments in our life where our cosmic buddy disagrees with our lifestyle, and we go, oh, that can't be God, because we only view him as friend. Like, have you actually ever had a friend disagree with a certain thing in your lifestyle and listen to them? Like, for real. Like, you ever had a friend go, hey, let me give you some advice, and you're like, nope, don't need it. Not from you. I know your life, and it's messed up, and your life ain't going to help my life. And oftentimes, this is how we treat God. We pray to our buddy, not our king. You see how, you see how perceptions affect your conversations? You see, it's, it's in this where we must develop the correct perception in order to have a correct prayer life with God. We must know him clearly and in depth and all that. I must hold in tension that he is a judge, but he's also a friend, but he's also a creator, but he's also a provider, but he's also a protector, and he's also a father. He's also a father. So it's only with the correct perception of God can I have a correct conversation with God. Let me say that again so you can use it this week. Only when I have the correct perception of God can I have a correct conversation with God with God. It's when we develop the right perception in our prayer life where our prayer life goes deeper. So, so where do we need to go to develop the right perception? You see, Jesus teaches us in Luke chapter 11, verses 1 and 2, Lord teaches to pray. Okay, disciples, prayer was not new, but teach me. And he said to this, when you pray, say Father. Now, many of us, we know this. We, we, we have an understanding that God is, or we have a knowledge that God is our Father, but our heart has not yet understood it. Let me, give you, let me try to illustrate this for you. In theory, in theory, we know He's our Father, but in transformation, we don't know yet. So how many of you guys have ever gone to a vending machine, and you've seen a Dr. Pepper, or you've seen some Cool Ranch Doritos that you want? In my high school, it was always Little Debbie's. I was one of the Nutter Butter Little Debbie's. That's what I wanted, right? And, and I can remember that was sometimes I would go to these vending machines and I would have a quarter and I would put it in, but it didn't drop. You know, you had inserted it, but it didn't fall. Now, if you're like me, I body slammed the vending machine. I was like trying to kick it. I was doing WWE wrestling moves on it because I wanted the quarter to count. And I only had a limited supply of money. Many of us, with this idea of fatherhood and God is our father, the quarter is in our brain, but it has not dropped into our heart. The quarter, like, yeah, yeah, I know God is my father, but we don't feel him as father. We don't see him as father. We don't connect with him as father. We come to God in our limited perception, and therefore our connection is limited. So Jesus says, when you come to God, call him Father. You know, if my children come to me during the week when they get home from school or any other time and they come to me and they go, hey, Pastor Eric of Victory City Church, can I tell you, I'm offended. What's the matter with you? Like, have your children ever tried to call you by your first name? Hey, Eric, nah, it ain't happening. 
No, no, you ain't calling me by my first name. My mother gave me that. You didn't. You can't use it. Right? Don't call me Eric. You can call me dad. Can I tell you, God feels the same way about you? God feels the same way about you. And Jesus is teaching us something here. He's saying, come to God as Father. You see, it was really a revolutionary idea that Jesus even launched with this. You see, prayer was not a new thing to the disciples. And Jesus, for my Bible people who really like to get into the details, Jesus is the first person in all of Scripture to address God as Father. First person. All the prophets... Abraham, Moses, David, Solomon, Noah, all the great men of the Old Testament, Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, all the great men of the Old Testament, they never addressed God as Father. They acknowledged Him as Father, but they never addressed Him. Meaning this, you can address me as Natalie's husband, or you can acknowledge me, messed it up, You can acknowledge that I am Natalie's husband, but Natalie is the only one in this room and on this planet that can actually address me as her husband. So let me try this really quick. I can acknowledge that you have children. I cannot come up to your children and address them as my children. See what I'm saying? Y'all be like, I'm calling the cops. You're weird. (laughs) I can acknowledge, yeah, 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 that's your children. I can't come up and say, hi, children, you're mine now. It's weird. So what Jesus is doing here is actually quite revolutionary, quite scandalous. It's actually the thing that got Jesus killed. You see, when Jesus was in the temple and he was talking to the religious people, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when he would say, I'm about my father's business, they thought it was scandalous. Who's this man talking about God as his father? But Jesus gives us a secret to prayer. Before he even begins to tell you how to pray, he says the first thing you have to do is develop the correct perception of who God is. Because if you don't develop the correct perception, you won't have the right conversation, and therefore your connection will be shallow. You see, some of us, we only pray to God as this big, mean, scary judge. Or we only come to God as our cosmic buddy. But God through Jesus, is actually saying, no, come to me as Father. Can I just encourage you really quick? God is not just a Father. He is our Father, and He is my Father. He is my Father. He is your Father who loves you so deeply, and He wants you to address Him in a relational term so you can have the right perception for the right conversation in prayer. I mean, think about it. A father in a much lesser way kind of encapsulates God. God is a provider. A father is a provider. God is a friend. At times, a father is a friend. God is a judge. At times, a father is a judge. You're grounded. Go to your room. God is a creator. Fathers are creators. Come on, how many of your moms said, I brought you into this world. I will take you out of this world. Now, fathers had a much lesser role in bringing children into the world, but we were still involved. Just saying. My kids think I'm a creator creator on a regular basis. They think I just create money. Dad, can you buy this? Yeah, yeah. Well, what are you going to use to buy it? I don't know. Just go find some money. In Jesus' name, let there be a thousand, a thousand, a thousand. It's not working. I'm sorry. I can't do it. <laughs> you see, what, what Jesus is trying to do is he's trying to, help your, he's trying to help your perception. And I think that's why so many of us, we come to God and we feel our prayers are limited because we don't have the correct perception. Jesus doesn't say come to him as holy God or Savior, or Lord, or King. No, Jesus says, come to God and address Him as Father. So so let me just give you something really practical. And then we're going to jump into the rest. What if every time you pray this week, you address God as Father? Father. It's Tuesday. Father. It's Wednesday. Father. 
And every day that you continue to address him as father, I wonder if the quarter begins to drop. Because then you begin to develop a perception of God that is correct. And here's what will happen. Your conversation with God will go deeper. So, so what does God do for us? And why does Jesus teach us to come to God as Father? i got a few thoughts for you, and then we're going to jump into them. The first one is this. God is a Father I can confess to. Psalm 62, verse 8 says this. Trust Him at all times, O people, and pour out your heart before Him. You see, this is not just a confession of wrong things. It's not just a confession of sin, the things I've messed up. Because I don't know about you, but I carry a lot more weight in my life than just the areas I've messed up. Sometimes I carry anxiety and pressure. Sometimes I feel like the destiny and dream God's given me for my life, that's a lot. I feel like there's moments where there's just this pressure to produce. There's this pressure to be everything I'm supposed to be for all the people in my life. Come on, does anybody ever feel like you're carrying a lot? What God says is this, is come to me and pour out your heart. Pour out your heart for the things that you think God doesn't care about, for the things that are weighing you down, for the things that, that, that trouble your soul. And isn't it interesting that, that when you try to talk to a friend, or listen, even your spouse, and you pour your heart out before them, you always feel like their understanding is limited. And they try to give you words that are like, oh man, I'm praying for you. I'm there with you. And you leave that conversation, although very well-meaning, still feeling burdened. Has anybody ever done that? And sometimes, married, married people, we try to process and have our spouse work it out for us. Can I just help you really quick? Your spouse is not your counselor. Your sp it's too much. They've got their own thing. And then when you take your thing and you go, hey, can you figure this out for me? It crushes them. They can help. In fact, Scripture says that a friend is there to help carry your burden, but God is there to lift off your burden, to lift it off your shoulders, to lift it off your soul, to lift it off your heart. And can I tell you that no one can do that for you except your heavenly Father. There's, there's a confession that must take place. Now, here's the thing. God does not want you to confess so that he can gain more information about you. God knows what you did Friday night. Come on, you remember the parent tactic where you would do this with your kids or maybe a teacher would do this to you and they would come in and they don't really know what's going on, but they use this. So, um, you got anything you need to tell me? I held it close. No, I don't. Nothing. Nothing. You gotta have some video evidence for me to start spilling, right? Like I ain't saying nothing. I'm not a snitch. Here's the deal: God doesn't want you to confess because He needs to know what you did last week. He knows. He knows all the good, the bad, the messy, the ugly, the pretty. He knows. God does not say this when you come to prayer. So, Eric. Is there anything you need to tell me about? Yeah, God, like I had some. He knows! Yeah. So why would God want us to pour our heart out if he already knows? Because when we understand what it means to be known by God, to truly be known, to truly take everything that we carry, the things that burden us, the things that weigh us down, can I tell you that there is a joy and a confidence on the other side of going, God is too much for me. God is too big for me. God, there's nothing I can do to solve it. I can't handle the pressure. You take it. And here's the beauty of it. You can do it every day. Why? Because just because you do it once doesn't mean it goes away. Like, how many of you guys struggle with fear sometimes? It's not like on Tuesday you're like, God, I'm giving you all my fears, and Wednesday is great. Oftentimes it's Tuesday, God, I'm giving you all my fears, and Wednesday at 5 a.m., those same fears are right there. 
Anybody else out like that? Like, come on, preach with me. Come on, 1045. I know you're sleepy. 915 was a little more lit than you, so come on, keep it up, right? Like, and guess what I do Wednesday? I confess to my father. And guess what I do Thursday? I confess to my father. And guess what I do Friday? I confess to my father. Why? Because the troubles of this world are too much for us to handle. I can always tell when my kids are troubled. Come on, how many of you guys, you got a friend like that? Hey, what's, what's going on? And you can see they're carrying things. And you know, and maybe some of you have friends that are reluctant. Each one of my kids are different. I got one kid that's like, Bleh, everything. I got some other kids that are like, nothing. I'm good. Jesus says, come to your father and confess It says this, the purpose is in Proverbs 20, verse 5, the purpose in a man's heart is like deep water, but a man of understanding will draw it out. Who can understand the deepness of your soul unless they are deeper than you? You see, in God we have a Father who is deep enough, strong enough, wise enough to carry the things in your life. So my question this week is, will you come to the Father and just confess what's going on in your life? There have been seasons in my life where I felt like I was carrying so much I couldn't pray at home because my family think I'm crazy. So like I go on a walk and like I let it all out. Like I'm screaming. I'm yelling at God. And the neighbors are calling the police. But can I say, when I walk back in the door of the house, guess where the burden has been left? With God. So what are you carrying? And what's your perception of God that he wouldn't care about what you're carrying? You see, some of us have this performer mentality with God and we feel like we can't bring it to him because it actually demotes us in Christian status if we're not handling certain things. But God's saying, no, no, no. Confess it. The good, the bad, the things that weigh you down, the anxiety, the depression, the fear, all, will you just confess it? The second thing that God does as a father is this, is he is where I can find true compassion. He's where I can find true compassion. In fact, it says this in Psalms 145, and I want you to look at this closely. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. The funny thing about that psalm is this. It doesn't say that God doesn't get angry. It says that he's slow to anger. You know that anger really is not the absence of love, but oftentimes it's the result of love. So let me just ask all the dads in the house. Can you, if all the dads in the house, can you say, hey, y'all? All All right, let me ask you a really personal question. How many of you guys have ever been angry with your kids? That's like three of y'all. Come on, like, come on. How many of y'all have ever been angry with your kids? Can I write, okay, thank you. And if your kids are sitting next to you, that's just a testimony. I have been angry with my kids at some point. Come on, how many mothers in the room have been angry with their kids at some point? Okay. For all the people who have at some point gotten angry with their kids, can you give me an amen? Amen. Do you still love them? You see, when we have a perception of God as a friend, and then we feel his anger, we think he doesn't love us. But that's actually a result of a very deep love. You see, it's a common story, and you've probably heard it in your own context, in your own forms. But I remember growing up in a very strict, rigid household, and they loved me. But, you know, as a teenager, I was a little rebellious and wanted to do my own thing. And I remember complaining to my friends about how my parents were so strict. They wouldn't let me go here. They wouldn't let me do this. They would never, you know, all these types of things. And, and I would see my friends, and some of them had parents who didn't care what they did. Yeah, do what you want. You don't have a curfew. Here's money. Do what your thing. And for a season, it was fun. And I was jealous of that. 
but you probably have a friend that said the same thing. Uh, there comes a moment where uh, really it almost turns. And then you have that friend whose parents allowed them to do whatever they want, never got angry, oh yeah, yeah, it's cool, never got in trouble, had all the things they wanted to do in their life. And then one day when you were complaining about your situation, they would say something like this, I wish my parents cared enough about me to put boundaries on me. Meaning this, that oftentimes ambivalence is a sign of hate. Not love. So scripture says this, the Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love. And so here's the thing, when we come to God and confess, that's where we go to the actual true source of love in which we shall receive compassion. Come on, parents. Your child makes you angry, but there's just something about being a parent that's like, but I still got to love you. Now here's the deal, anger not appropriately applied, can become abuse. So, so us dads, moms, sometimes we've said some things to our kids and we have to go back and be like, listen, I was angry. I'm sorry. I shouldn't have said that. Can I tell you that God never has to do that to you? Because God is appropriately angry. He is never abusive. He is never ambivalent. He is the right, perfect amount of love, compassion, anger. When you begin to go off the trail and go, no, no, lean in here. I love you. I'm angry with you. I'm correcting you. I'm giving you compassion. Why? Because I love you. Because you're my son and daughter. Because I'm your father. So when we come to God, when we come to God, we come to him not as an angry judge, even though he is a judge, we come to him as father. So let me ask you this. I want you to ask yourself, and this is going to be revealing to how you see God. When you fail, when you fail, do you run to God or do you run from God? When you do something in your life that you know is not pleasing to Him and you make a mistake, you do something you... You know that your heart is not in alignment with how God wants. Is your first reaction to run to God and say, Father, help me fix this. There's been moments in my life where, just in my personal life, especially when I was a young man, I just would do stupid things. And I remember I would try to solve them myself because I was afraid of actually telling my earthly father what was going on. And then the situation continues to get worse and worse. How many of you ever tried to fix a situation alone and all you do is mess it up? I remember there was one situation, I won't go into the details of it, but I was in over my head. And I didn't want to tell my dad because I, I had this perception and fear that my dad was going to kill me. Like, actually. I'm dead. I know it. He has a gun and I know he'll use it. And I remember finally when I came to him and I said, hey, here's what's going on. And you know how you get clever and you try to phrase it in a way that's nice. I was working really hard, Dad, and it was, I was trying to make it work. I read my Bible even. Like I was reading and trying to find wisdom and, and all these things. And you know what my dad said to me? I wish you would have come to me first. Can I tell you that you have a father in heaven that just says, I wish you would have come to me first. I wish you would have come to me first. So for the performer, the achiever, the perfectionist, when you are trying to perform for everybody else, do you ever get weary? Do you ever get wore out? Do you ever feel like it's too much? Or do you rest in the knowledge that your father loves you and you don't have to prove a thing to him? That tells you about your perception. So God is a father I can confess to. God is the father I receive compassion from. And finally, God is a father who calls us home. Psalm 62 verse 8 says this, Trust in him at all times. O people, pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. There's something about home, isn't there? 
Like, can y'all remember how your childhood home smelled? It's interesting, the link between what you smell and what we remember. Like, you ever go home to your parents' house and you smell your parents? You're like, oh, this is, this is what I grew up in. Isn't it kind of weird to go back to your hometown and see your home totally different? It's kind of sad. It's like, oh, man, my house was so nice. Or that was just where I have so many memories. And now there's like a shopping center. It's kind of sad, isn't it? I read a stat the other day that, that uh, people who immigrate to America spend over $10 billion a year going back home. Because even though they're grateful to be here, there's something in them that misses home. Isn't it funny, even with food, right? Like, like the further north you move, the worse the Mexican food gets. That's why all the people from the valley are like, Austin's got nothing. Like, it's in the valley. That's where it's at, right? Come on. That's why all the Californians are trying to hate on Austin's tacos. Like, no, California doesn't have the best tacos, right? You know, there's just something, right? Like, like there's just something about missing home. I mean, all the people from Oregon and Washington, they're like, actually, I miss nothing. I'm just glad to be in Texas in Jesus' name. <laughs> Praise God. I'm just having fun. Now you miss the trees, don't you? The coffee. You, you miss something about home. Remember when you went to college for the first time or moved away? Like you tried to act tough. It was good. And maybe it was a bad situation that you were happy to get out of. But there's still parts of you that was homesick for the people. Isn't it interesting that you can like travel, stay in a really nice hotel? Like you're in a really nice hotel, got a great pillow. And even if their pillow is more expensive than your pillow at home, there's just something about your own pillow. Even if their mattress is nice and you got all the things, there's just something about your mattress. It's mine. It's home. And even if you go on the greatest vacation and it's so much fun, by the end of that vacation, you're ready to go where? Home. There's something about being home. Whether it's your mom's cooking, whether it's your friends, whether it's the smells, there's something about being home. And it's interesting, why is it that it is pre-built? It's like an operating system that comes with the hardware to desire being home. The other day, my, uh, my son was, was three years old and there was a thunderstorm and he was terrified. He's crying. And uh, he, uh, he said, Dad, the thunder and lightning are going to get me. They're like, no, son. Isn't it crazy, the irrational fears of children? It's kind of like yours. Sometimes we have irrational fears. But the father knows, like nobody, we're, we're in a house. There's a roof, there's walls, there's windows. We're protected from the storm. But his fears were irrational. Now, here's the crazy thing. As a father, I did not shame him for his ignorance. What did I do? I just encouraged him and said, nobody, you're home. It's okay. Some of you are carrying fears that feel irrational, that feel crazy. Can I tell you that you have a Father in heaven that doesn't shame you for it? In fact, Scripture says God is a refuge. Another form of refuge could be a home. Come on, when you're tired of people, when you're tired of work, you're tired of traveling, where do you just want to be? Home. There's something in your soul that just wants to be home, and you have a heavenly Father that is calling you home, not to a place, but to himself. Isaiah chapter 32, verse 18 says this, My people will abide in peaceful habitation, in secure dwellings, and in quiet resting place. Is that a place? No, no, no. That's in himself. God wants to talk to you every day so that every day you can spend some time at home. There's too many people that live spiritually homeless. And they try to, quote unquote, live in their workplace or live in their activity or live in their achievement, or live through social media and vicariously through other people. We have all these people who are spiritually trying to find a home in all these places, but God is a Father who says, come home. Come on, confess. 
What are you carrying? Come on, take it off. Take the burden off. I'm so thankful that God is a father that does not try to live vicariously through his children, but says, come home. Come home. You see, God wants to get to know you so you know what it's like to be known. Because I can't know you to the depth. You're too complex for me. There's too much to you. There's too much to me for you to know me. God wants to get to know you so that you know what it's like to be fully known. Fully. All of it. And then know what it's like to go and feel, hey, I still love you. Yeah, I'm angry at what you did there. You're being dumb. Let's fix that. But I love you. Welcome home. You see, a father gives three things and I'm done. A father gives existence. A father gives resemblance. And a father gives relationship. The kind of outer circle is existence. We are all here because at some point in our life, we had a natural father. And you know, we're all children of God in a general sense, but we're also not because Jesus says, until you come to me in faith, uh, then you're not adopted into my family. So in a general sense, yes, the whole world is God's sons and daughters. But there's something significant about finding our life in Christ after inviting Jesus into our heart and naming him Lord of our life. Resemblance. You see, when we walk with Jesus, we're to look more and more like him. And some of us in our areas in our life, we just need a little spiritual plastic surgery. But Jesus is saying this, I want to know you so you begin to look like me, act like me, think like me, be in the image of me. In fact, Jesus or God created you in the image of himself. We're to look like God. But the deepest level that a father brings is a relationship. I tell my kids this all the time when I'm going to close. Listen, you're going to have hundreds of friends in your life. But you're going to have one father. You're going to have one. Can I tell you that your prayer life will go deeper when you begin to have the perception, God, you are my father. Let's pray. Father, I pray for every person in the room today. God, I don't know how limited or how deep or how fruitful their prayer life is, but I know this, all of us can get better. There's still more that you want to speak with us about, show us, reveal to us in prayer. So Father, I just pray over every person, God, depending on what their specific perception of you is God I pray that it comes full circle I pray that I pray the quarter drops they don't just know you as father they understand you as father I pray that they can bring their burdens their sins their troubles their dreams their hopes their fears and they can confess them to you and just pour their heart out God, I pray that, that God, they find true compassion from you. Yes, there's times you get angry at us, but that's a source of love. It's not abuse. It's because you love us. You want to correct us. You want to help us. You want to empower us. And, And God, I just pray that every person today would know and feel the Father calling them home. And I pray that through prayer, we're able to walk into your presence and feel at home and know that we're home with you. No more homesick in our hearts. No more homesickness in our spirits. But God, we're home with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.